The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This episode is proudly brought to you by NetWealth. For over 21 years, NetWealth has provided market-leading technology, excellent customer support, and expertise to help wealth businesses thrive. As the financial advice landscape changes, it's important to embrace new technology to enhance the way you run your business. With change comes your chance to use advanced technology, reshape your client experience, and see wealth differently. Visit the website to learn how NetWealth can support your advice and wealth business. Hello and welcome to the XY Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamond Titus and this week we're going to deep dive into the width and breadth of Microsoft 365. And joining me here today is a podcast host, a meat smoker, a GoProing skier and a Queensland Reds rugby union fan. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Tom Freer. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, that's a Fair intro. Yeah. I didn't know. I did half of that stuff, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, you've done the once, and I've dug them out of the, the uh, social media out of the files. archives. Nice. Yeah, exactly. Can't hide exactly. on social media. Oh no, you know how glad are we? <laughs> I'm so glad that I didn't grow up in my like teens and twenties when social oh, media no. existed. Oof. Yeah, no, oh. I wouldn't be here today. I'm sure. Uh, correct. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm really keen to sort of dive into all things Microsoft, but I did sort of want to get to know you better via you, you as a user of technology first. So yeah. tell me, what is your most used emoji? Do you use emojis? I do use emojis, okay. um, and it depends what mood I'm in. But it's oh, oh. the thumbs up gets gets okay. everything. That's that's pretty much the the one. Um, there are some other ones that that do tend to go in there when uh, not in the right mood. But that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> the thumbs up. That's quite a. Now that I think about it, that's quite an Aussie bloke thing, right? I mean, I, I'm sure I internationally, so. yeah, they go. That's when, the... when you put that question to me. I was looking through my phone. I had, I do a lot of thumbs ups, and it's just <laughs> it could be for anything. It's thanks, hello, yeah. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's generically acceptable. I love it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> now, if you had to delete all but three apps from your smartphone, you could only have three. Which ones would you keep? Oof. Um, definitely the phone because I do prefer to talk. Okay. Um, chat gets used a lot. So I um, surprisingly WhatsApp because um, I actually use a lot of WhatsApp, which is uh, which is good. Okay. Um, and if if I really pulled it down to running the business, it would be Microsoft Teams. Teams, okay. So they're yeah, probably the three that that I live in the most. Okay, and on your phone, yeah. not just um, not just you know your desktop or anything like that. You're using no, on that's phone on my too. phone. So we awesome. do, yeah, I can do do all of that, which is great. So keep in contact, keep keep across what's going on, just the way we've got things structured. But yeah, they're the three. So are you one of those dreaded people that dial into a team meeting from your car and it's wobbly and you give everybody <laughs> car sickness on the team meeting? <laughs> well, I've been known to do that. Yes, yep, yep. <laughs> I haven't quite uh, got the phone set up in the car yet. Or you get right. those straps where people can be anywhere and they have the green screen behind them. I don't know if you've seen that on socials. Yes, it's I pretty have. funny. Yeah. Uh, that's not me. No. No. And that's <laughs> I not- am in the office today, so it's all right. <laughs> Very good. Well, and that's not me too, because I'd end up running into something. I can't do two <laughs> things at once. So, so I can't be out and about while talking on a team meeting. That's not yeah, gonna it's, work. It's funny some of that stuff. But yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's sort of dive into Microsoft and three six five. And I'm actually really interested in this discussion because 
um, like I mentioned before we started the recording, um, we on our, in our advice business some years ago made the decision to go to G Suite. Um, and so, but I was an avid user of Microsoft prior to that. And in fact, years ago was uh, an analyst. So I was heavily into Excel back then. Mm. I was one of those sort of full on yep. hardcore users of Excel. So let's sort of take a step back and, you know, stick with us listeners, because we are going to have to go to the basics first, and then we're going to dive in. So Microsoft 365 has is in that silly productivity category, right? I don't know what they mean by productivity because that implies that every other app not in that category is not productive. So I don't quite understand (laughs) why we call it that. (laughs) It's a productivity suite is what Microsoft love to call it. Right, right, exactly. Um, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. If it's going to give us a a jolt of productivity, that's awesome. Hmm. But that's sort of the core is then, you know, your Word, Excel, PowerPoint, what, and Outlook? Is that sort of the core parts of? Yeah, so if we go sort of look at the the framework. Microsoft 365 is their cloud version of essentially emails where it started. Yep. So prior to the the big boom around cloud, people would have email servers in their office running Microsoft Exchange. Now Microsoft then went, right, we're going to move that to the cloud and we're going to call it, well, I think they called it business productivity suite originally. Mm-hmm. Um, BPOS, I think was the technical term. And then it changed to Office 365 and that's where we've got email in the cloud and we do have our word excel powerpoint um those common apps that we use yeah um now they're the ones that everyone's familiar with and have been familiar with forever right you've had the um whatever version of windows you'd have in office 97 office 2003 whatever it was it's now just called office 365 okay office 365 now you mentioned something actually there because i just wanted to jump back on it because there may be some listeners here who haven't recognized this as an evolution is there any reason reason really that that a business should have their email servers still sort of local rather than in the cloud is there any reason somebody really. should do that no okay not really look we we've we do still have clients who do have it running locally and that's m- not a not a technical decision it's barely even a business decision it's really around we're just not ready to move okay um and particularly for larger organizations um we see that so okay. but for for the small and mid market yep. um there, there is no reason, no value to have no an, cyber an email sort of server. security or anything like that. That's any different. Okay, you're I at think- more risk having it on on site than you would be in the cloud. Okay, well, that's probably yeah. a surprise for some people, right? Because it yeah. feels like you can put a wall around it when it's local. <laughs> When it's in your well, there, there is that. There's that physical element that sure. you can put a wall around sure. it. But if you if you really look at it from a technical perspective, um, the amount of um, money and investment it would take for you to implement the security controls that Microsoft do out of the box right. on your own system, you yeah. just you wouldn't do it because it's too costly. Whereas yeah. going to the cloud, we have multi-factor authentication straight out of the box. It's there. Yeah. yeah. Locked down, secured. That's a that's a whole additional implementation if you were trying to do that yourself. Fantastic. Okay, so that's yep. really good insight. Um, before we sort of dive into the more of the beyond the ones we just mentioned, I did want to ask a couple of things. So, I mean, is Access still something that people use? I remember Microsoft, you know, MS Access um, being Scarily, a database yes. tool. You're, okay, so, but is it unlikely? It's is it the sort of thing that somebody who hasn't used it should look at, or is no, it really, really an older? Okay, it's an older it's product. It's sort of a legacy thing there. That okay. Look, there are still people that use it and they'll upgrade it and continue to do, but it's generally been something that's been done back in the day and it's just continued to evolve um, the new version. But okay. um, with where the other platforms and products are now, you'd, it'd be a very unusual need to, to have or want to use access. Yeah, okay. And I yeah. guess that's part of what the challenge that Microsoft faces is, I mean, they are <laughs> in you know, most machines globally. So, mm-hmm. so they are dealing with every uh, evolution of user. And so they can't just willy nilly go, nope, not doing that anymore because they're anymore. Yep. <laughs> because they truly are, you know, in, I mean, schools that might have had a machine that's 10 years old or, you know, like all sorts of places. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, we can walk into an organization and find a machine in the corner that's still running the oldest version of Windows you've ever seen because there's this one application that someone built in 1995 on an access database. And yeah. they just haven't decided or haven't been able to or haven't had the want to, to move it or change it. Yeah, okay. And look, I should have yeah. I should have explained um listeners that Tom is um Tom owns Wintech. You've you're owns found Wintech, yep. yeah, and Wintech yep, is a consulting, fantastic um consulting firm that based in Brisbane but works nationally with businesses to assist with all things IT and 
things like we're going to be talking about today. So he isn't from within Microsoft. Um, and what I loved about that is that we can have these debates. We can really be quite frank about what works, what doesn't, and the evolution. Um, because I think lots of us with these these tools that we almost forget are software. I mean, I think we almost forget their apps and tools that we choose. Mm. They're just on our machine, and so we just turn They're them just on. There. Yeah, so there we go. Yep. I think we sort of, you know, having a deep discussion about this is important. Now, the other one that I actually hadn't seen before, once again, because I haven't used it for a while, is Publisher. And for the two seconds yep. I looked, is that sort of halfway between Word and PowerPoint? Like, is it a sort of... Um, no, Publisher's probably more along the lines of like an Adobe um, okay. Photoshop, not Photoshop, uh, Illustrator and things like that. Okay. So creating marketing brochures and, and, and bits and pieces, I okay. don't see it heavily used. Some people still use it. I, most people are probably, if they're into that heavy duty um, marketing side of things, they're using something like Adobe, the Adobe yeah. suite. And, yeah. and even for a small business, you know, I mean, we use Canva. A lot for that sort yeah, of stuff. Yeah, that's, it's that's just, right. All that sort of stuff. Right, so much available and it's so flexible yeah. and, and yeah. so many templates. Love a good template. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't have to get lost in that place. Right, yeah. it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's my equivalent of, of doom scrolling on social media is I just dive into Canva <laughs> and have a whole lot of fun with the templates. It's hysterical. So then, okay, so that's the call. And then just to create the picture, then we have all the rest, you know, Teams, OneDrive, Forms, Planner, OneNote, yeah. I wrote down Flow, Power Automate, Bookings, SharePoint, SharePoint Power, yeah. right? Yeah. So there's all these other things around it. Are most of mm. those then like an add-on as in a sort of subscriber extra? How does that work? So most people are probably paying for it already. Okay. Um, so when you buy your Microsoft 365 subscription, there's different versions, basic, I mean, in, in this market. Um, and for the listeners, you're probably using business basic, business standard or business premium. Yep. Um, now... I don't know how deep you want me to go on those, no, no, but essentially, no. um, but essentially, you've got your business basic, which is more of the cloud only sort of offer. Right. So you don't get the desktop applications with your business basic. Okay. So you don't get the the full version of Word and Excel. Yep. You use everything in the browser. Okay. Which is probably closely, more closely aligned with like the Google G yep. Suite sort of approach yep. um, where everything's online. You're not really using any local apps and things like that. Yeah. Um, business standard gives you then all the cloud functionality, and it gives you the desktop apps. Local, so okay. what everyone's familiar with, the full version of Word, Excel, Outlook, all the bits that go with it. And then Business Premium really then has all of that, plus it's got a whole security suite wrapped around it, okay. um, which is really important where we are today. Yes. Um, now, within all of those, you get access to email, uh, OneDrive, Teams, mm-hmm. Planner. Um, okay. What else do we say? OneNote, you get Forms? access to pa- Forms is in there. Okay. Uh, bookings is in standard and premium. Um, okay. So and the, yeah. the automation one, flow or power automate, whatever uh, that is. Flow and power automate are in in all of those. Okay. Um, okay. And there are, but there are then additions to that to do more advanced things. Okay. So we can can touch on that. Okay. So they cool. give you a taste of everything. Yeah. Um, and probably the big one that's included that no, not many people really leverage is SharePoint. Okay. Um, being in there, and that's. That's a really core piece to the whole online productivity um, and then building your automation out from there. That becomes the core of all your data. That's okay. Essentially it. So, okay. Yeah. So it's almost, is it almost like the blanket over all of them that sort of can, yeah, can see it think all? Yeah, about it that way. Um, so things like where you would typically have files stored on a file server yep. or in Dropbox or on, on OneDrive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's SharePoint becomes that repository for all of that data. Yeah. Um, it becomes your intranet. Okay. So you can have your, your news and your posts and all the bits up there. You can have yep. feeds and weather and whatnot. Um, but really structured around where where are people going to go to find the information they need to do their job. Right. Okay. And so like there's OneDrive and there's SharePoint. Is it either or? Is it and? Is it? No, it's 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 or. Okay. Oh, it's it's. I'll, I'll say it's it's for a specific need. So okay. there's actually three. You've got OneDrive, mm-hmm. um, and the way to look at that is one one person. One okay. User. Okay. So it ideally personal, is your personal situation, personal storage. Okay. So OneDrive is great. You put OneDrive. So OneDrive for business is what's included in your 365 suite. Yeah. And just to confuse things, Microsoft have OneDrive Personal as well. Okay, which good. Is <laughs> same product, different login. Okay. Very painful. But for organizations, you'd have OneDrive for business. Yeah. Now, it's the if you're familiar, it's the little app that you install on your machine and it will sync your data 
from your PC up to the cloud. Um, in a business scenario, we use it extensively to redirect things like your My Documents go into there, okay. your desktop points to that, um, your pictures and stuff like that. So if your PC ever dies, yep. you just get a new PC, put that app on and all your data comes back. And you're back, all good. Okay. And away you go. So that's that's OneDrive. You can then share out of OneDrive. So as an, as an individual, you can control who you want to give access to data to. Yeah. So whether it's someone in the business, um, whether it's someone outside. So you control that. Um, what you don't want to be doing is setting up your entire business structure in your business storage in OneDrive. Okay. And which I bet you see a fair bit of because people mis- sort of misunderstand of it. What, what it is. They yeah. think it's the same as a Dropbox for Teams or a whatever C- correct, and use yeah, it that way. Yeah. Okay. And so, use it that way okay. and, it, and it's not. Okay. It's, so what you've got to, if it's because it's that personal element, one person will set that up and they'll set up a structure and then they will share that folder with someone and it's up to them to manage that and it gets oh, really, really dear. ugly, really okay. messy. Okay. Um, so that's a, a no-no in our in our sort of view. Okay. Um, that's where SharePoint comes into it. Okay. All right. So SharePoint is the share Right. Shared with everyone internally. We can create external sharing. We can invite people in. We can do all sorts of stuff. Okay. So then if you're in your small business, SharePoint is where all of the business documents and stuff lives, um, whereas uh, the OneDrive might be where it's almost like it's the um, channel or backup from the individual's machine. That might be something yeah. that's personal, but it's not Working where... documents, yeah, things okay. like that. Okay, like so... you might be working on a, on a tender or something and it's just you working on it. Yeah. It's not really need to be visible to everyone. So you'd save that in your OneDrive, you work on it, which means you can access it anywhere you want. Yeah. When it's ready to be published to the, the wider business, it you just push up. it up into SharePoint, okay. into the client folder or however you want it structured. Okay, perfect. Look, I think that's probably really helpful. There'll be some people listening like, pop we've been using this the wrong way. I'm betting that's quite common when you go into businesses. It is, it is. Because it is hard to – look, the language used in tech is hard to begin with and then you'll hear a description and these things sound exactly the same and it's like, well – you know, how am I meant to pick? What am I meant to pick? And this is the real challenge. And and Microsoft, in in all their genius, they've, they've got these awesome tools, but they don't really give people, end users, mm. um, any sort of real direction around best case scenarios and things like that. So you'll, you'll have scenarios, OneDrive. Look, OneDrive, we can, we can isolate. But then you get into things like Teams and SharePoint. Teams is built on top of SharePoint, which just okay. adds to the confusion. So, okay. um, but it's it's understanding the best use case for your organization. Yeah, okay, um, perfect. And yeah. I, I'm betting that um, invariably uh, there's some pain in that process. Like invariably when you make that sort of transition, you've probably been using something that's either personal or, or a bit restrictive and coping through a whole lot of structure and rules. And then you need to transition to really get effectiveness for sharing with a team. Yep. Um, and there is some pain in that, but I think, you know, once you do make that change, then I think, you know, you'd be stunned. People would be stunned how smooth it can make things. You oh, know? yeah. And, it just... And- <laughs> It's amazing. And you you did say it, what you said there, it's the pain in the change. And it's not so much the technical element of taking it from one spot to the other. That's that's neither here nor there. That's that's a process we go through. It's the it's the users. I used to always do it this way and this is the way I want to do it. Yeah. Well, we're not doing it that way anymore. This is how we're going to do it. And more importantly, this is why we're going to do it this way. Yes. Well, yeah. and I'm betting like in the in the coaching and sort of speaking I've done in, in not so much in tech space, it's sort of process, you know, it's just getting efficient and things like that. I find it's the business leader that's the worst one. Often they're the ones that can't let go of the old way, you know. Yeah, that's, <laughs> just, that's, that's but, very but true. That's good. We'll do that for the, everything. Everybody in the team do it this way but I'm still going to do it that I'm way. I'm going to keep doing it this way. But no, yeah. <laughs> that's not We've all got to jump in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and, and you've got to go in. But yeah. I think the key thing people get stuck on in some of these projects as well is they think they have to get it right from day one. Um, now, particularly with SharePoint and Teams and Microsoft in that, it's designed to be fluid. Yeah. So the way we work with our clients is very much right. Let's Let's go through a process. Let's understand where your data currently sits and how it's structured. This is what it can look like in SharePoint. This is where we'll put things and how it works. But if it's not right on day one or you use it for three months and you need and you go, that's not right, we can just move it. Yeah. It's up in the cloud now. We can shuffle it, we can change it, we can adapt. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of it. Yeah. Um it, it is it it's designed to do that. And I think the thing about the cloud that um well, I see that most people don't take advantage to 
of is the whole linking direct from one thing to another. So you might be in your CRM and you're dealing with a particular client. Well, in, in you know, in the sort of more manual way, then you're trying to find a uh, something you'd, you know, sent to the client previously or work you've done and you go and you subfolder, subfolder, dig down, find the thing, you know, whereas, I mean, we've now got links direct from the CRM to that client's folder (laughs) so that click straight in, right? right? Exactly. And that, and those things sound small, but you do that 40 times a day. So anything, you know, that can get you back a few few minutes multiplied by 40, um, I think makes a bit, and I'm betting that's a lot of what happens once people really get on top of the Microsoft sort of suite of tools is they can really get back multiple minutes everywhere. Well, I'll give you a, a huge example of, of what we see um, is that you're working on a proposal, for example, or, a, or a, 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 an advice document or something like yep. that. Um, you're working on it. You need someone in your team to review that. What most people will do is they'll attach that file to an email. They'll send that file over an email. Yep. Someone will open that file. They'll make changes in that file. They'll send back that copy. You've then got to work out which copy they made and yep. update those. Imagine doing that with three, four, ten people. Like it's yeah. you know, with 15 versions of it. <laughs> yep. Put it in SharePoint in one location. Everyone works on the same file. Everyone's working in the same file at the same time, and we can actually see who's making what changes on the on the fly. Um, the amount of time that saves is is amazing. Yeah, and, and that's just one little thing by not sending an email, or when you send the email, you send a link instead of the file. Yeah, and yeah. I think the other sort of mindset then that that often needs to change too is lots of people use email as their to do list. <laughs> so they yeah. wait for somebody to email them something that's, and they're like, that's all oh, I've got to do that. Yeah. Instead of, that. Right. Instead of having that either in your CRM or elsewhere where that's what drives what you do in the day and yep. that's where handover, you know, might happen or yeah, yeah. that sort of yep. thing. They do this whole email backwards and forwards. I mean, it's backwards crazy. Backwards and forwards and that. And, right. It's, um, but again, so, we look at we look at there's tools are plenty. I mean, we've got all these off the shelf, um, other products we could use, Asana and Monday yes, and, and whatever. Loads. Um, huge. We've got it in Microsoft, Microsoft okay. Planner. We'll do 80% of a lot of those tools okay. by itself. Okay. Well, now so I, had that, like that. I had that noted down. Why don't we dive into that a second while we're um while we're on the topic? Jumping all over the shop, sorry. Oh, we have. <laughs> yeah, sorry, listeners. We'll, we'll get there, I promise. Um, so Microsoft Planner, is this project upgraded? The old Microsoft no, project? No, it's it's project cut down. Okay. It's the other way. So, because project was pretty horrible, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, project is a massive, massive tool, and yes. it, it takes a lot to get it to work well. Yeah. Um, very few organisations, particularly in, in financial services and accounting, would would have really any value within yeah. using Microsoft Project. Yeah. Um, whereas Planner, on the other hand, it's it's a very simply structured task management system for your team. Okay. Um, think of it, I don't know if people have used Asana, where yep. you've got your buckets of, of, um, of tasks. Yep. Exactly the same concept. We create a bucket or we create a plan. Yep. We create a bucket. We invite whoever, we invite our team into that plan. Yep. And then we can start assigning tasks and creating tasks and scheduling tasks and, and all that. It will send reminders. We can add notes. We can link to files that are all over our Microsoft. Okay. Um, that then can actually flow into your Outlook. So you have a view in Outlook for all of your to-do items across your Outlook personal okay. tasks and your planner tasks and all this sort of stuff. So it um, starts to tie it all together. Yeah, nice. And so is that the sort of place then that you might do something like a deal pipeline, you know, something that's sort of that snapshot yeah, we've, we've for seen the business? That. Yep. yep. So we've seen people use it as a, as a very basic CR, well, deal pipeline in that sense. Yeah. Suspect discovery, right. open, quoted, closed, and they can drag their, their tasks through it that way. Works works well for that. Because it's um, something that um, – so that work in progress or, you know, that sort of thing that's transitioning and just keeping an eye on that as a team, you know, in the team meeting, let's take a look. Um, yeah. It's not something that's necessarily easy to do in most of our tools in advice. So, you know, something mm. that could help have that picture um, and, and keep that momentum. I think it's hard when, you, when you're handling multiple sort of, you know, demands. How do you keep yeah. that momentum with things? So that's with interesting. There. Okay, yeah. so, so any, anything be- like that is is quite good, um, and then yeah, as you say, use it use it in your weekly meetings, your daily stand ups, those type of things, and it's it's visual. Everyone can see it. Um, you can integrate it into your Microsoft team so it becomes that that point as well. Yeah. Um, and it and it's just visible. And that's probably something most of us don't do enough of. We're trying to retrain ourselves in our team is is instead of having. having meeting, you know, via Teams or whatever video version thing you use and then 
after somebody's, you know, assigning tasks or somebody's doing whatever. Now, we now, any meeting we have internally, we have those things shared or if people are viewing it and we're live adding things. Mm. You know, we're, we're just, just at the end of the meeting, it's it's all done. It's assigned. Done, walk away. Ticked. We all know what yeah, we're going to do. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I think, you know, those sort of things can make a big difference too. All right. So we sort of d- went round down a rabbit hole a little there. Um, I do want to just sort of get your take um, and – you know, this might be a hard question. Um, do you see certain businesses being more likely to be Microsoft versus, say, G Suite or not? Or like, is there any sort of lean? I mean, I guess just from my take, Microsoft has got much closer to to where G Suite, you know, now that they're in the cloud and they're doing all these things that are, inter, you know, interacting and connected, it's sort of mm. probably more similar than they were, um, you know, some time ago. Um, and yeah. I'm betting that the search, therefore, that sort of general search through all your stuff is easier in Microsoft than it used to be. Is that fair? Yeah, um, it's getting there. Look, yeah. I mean, Google were obviously the leader to it. They're the ones that came out with that that whole suite from, from the beginning and Microsoft were playing a lot of catch up. Yep. Um, and, and to be perfectly fair it really comes down to a personal preference yeah okay and it normally is driven by by leadership and the owners in that sense i like microsoft i like microsoft or i like google yes that's, that's really it yeah okay. um however when when you look at it a bit wider you've got to look at team structure team dynamics um the the the, the people in your team what what have they used yeah when when you look at it most people will turn on outlook word excel and can start right then and there and know exactly how to use it and get around yeah. and be effective in their job. If you're going from Microsoft to Google, it's a significant change in the way you do things. And if you're going to do it, you've got to go all in as well. Oh, yeah. There's no there's no point going, I'm just going to move my email and my docs over to here, but I still want everyone to use Word, Excel, PowerPoint. Mm-mm. Um You're now paying for two subscriptions as well. Yeah, and it just so, and it lets people hang back. We learned that yeah. the hard way. You've, you just you've can't. Got to you've go got to go all in. You've got to sort of effectively turn off the other. No, nope, yep. nobody, you know, yep. and go to the other. And I think there is one of the challenges, well, not challenges, but one of the considerations in financial advice, of course, is, you know, we're numbers, it's finance. Mm. And so, you know, uh, Google Sheets is never going to be anywhere near Excel in terms of no. true depth of spreadsheeting. So, you yep. know, in a business, if you really go hardcore Excel, you like if you're that numbers geek, then uh, yeah. Google yeah. Sheets will never Sheets give you that. It's not cut. designed That's to. Right. Now, to be fair, no. I would argue that 99.99% of Excel users never use any of that stuff. Correct. So it's fine. Correct. <laughs> you know, they think, you know, a spreadsheet is literally – just lines, you know, it's a page with lines yeah. on it and boxes. Like they think that's what a spreadsheet is. And so that's great. You know, I think then yep. Excel and, and Google, I mean, they're the same, you know, it does the, the same, same thing. Yeah. But yep. for a sort of a uh, hardcore advanced user, uh, you yep. just won't be able to do what you Pivot are used to doing. And, all of that and macros, and you know, all that whatever, stuff. All that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Look, and I think I think there's been a, a sort of point where, as I say, Google started that process and they were, they were, they designed their whole platform to be fully online. Yeah. Whereas Microsoft history has all been local. That's yeah. their his- history. Yeah. So Microsoft has sort of come in the other way. But what Microsoft have done, in my opinion, and I'm a little bit biased because I do like Microsoft sure. um, exceptionally well, is that it's it's now one. It doesn't matter. Like I can run my full version of Word, but all my data is in the cloud in real time. So it, it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, and I can get the full experience that I'm used to. If I really just want to check something really quickly, I can use the online version of Word. And I can go through and, and review a file really fast. Um, or if I need to do some editing and inserts, I can just open up in Word and, and away I go. Yeah, okay. Um, and that's the same. And okay. that's the same for Outlook as well. Yeah, okay. And so that's that's a fundamental difference though, isn't it? Is that the local version of this is, has more juice. So, you yeah, know, yeah, it yeah. has more juice, more functionality, more things, whereas yep. the online version is sort of for convenience. It's a, you yes. know, a quick yep. look, yep. a little bit of an edit maybe, but it's yep. not designed for sitting it's in. It's getting better, but it's not I, – I personally wouldn't see anyone really sitting in it day to day. Yeah, okay. Trying to create proposals and all that sort of stuff. Okay. Yep, review, okay. edit, quick updates, that sort of stuff. Perfect. Yeah. No yeah, problems okay. at all. Okay. Um, yeah. Awesome. Now, one of the things I did want to sort of ask is, you know, there'll be advisors listening to this, there'll be business owners, but also all of the support team. And I guess I had a question when you go into businesses and you're sort of tidying them up and getting them into shape. Um, do you find that there's members of the team that could really benefit with some more training in tools that maybe people don't expect that they would use? Like, do you find, look, there's admin teams that never have had Excel training or, you know, that sort of thing. Is mm. there something that people could really sort of lift their game? on that um, might enhance the whole business? 
Yeah, look, I think it's um I think that the first start is is the awareness piece around does everyone know what's available to them? Right. Does everyone know what's there? Um, because the amount of times we'll go in and people are using, they're still using Zoom, but they're paying for, they've already got Teams. Yeah. <laughs> L- little things like this, they might be, um, Calendly is another one. Everyone uses Calendly to, to do your, well, yep. you can do bookings now. Like it's, it's there. I didn't even so know that existed. That, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, Little things like that. And yeah. whilst they're not big, but you look at an organisation, three, four, 10, 15, 20 people, and oh, I need to licence Calendly so we can all be effective. Well, that's another subscription. Yeah. Um, if we made a little bit of an awareness and, and people are a little bit aware about the tools, and Microsoft are horrible at letting people know what they've actually got access to. Right, okay. Um, click your little button. If, you, if you're if you familiar with anyone who's familiar with your portal.office.com, you've got your little nine buttons up the top left when you click that you've just got this list of apps okay. that you can that you can use okay um but unless you really know um what they are so the first thing back to the question is awareness yeah um the, if we can make make your teams aware of what's available yeah because then what they will do instinctively and it just happens oh, i'll just have a bit of a tinker with this and, oh, and check see it out yeah and once they start to understand the capabilities of it, that's where they go actually you know what could we do this with it can we do this? We've got a whole lot of ideas for organisations that you can do, but it's got to be driven internally. Otherwise, it doesn't get adopted. And that's that's a key thing we see. We can come in and go, we're going to automate this process for you. And they go, oh, hang on. Oh, that's not going to work. It doesn't work for us. Automation doesn't work. Well, how about you play with this for a little bit? And yeah. they go, actually, you know, it would be a really cool idea if we automate this. Yeah, great. Well, let's let's go and do that. So it's, it's a little bit there. I think the awareness piece. Um, and Microsoft do have some uh, some some good online resources okay. about that and stuff like that. Okay. Um, even the the how tos and things like that. The help is pretty good within Microsoft for the the deep dive stuff. Um, yeah. But to your point, hardcore Excel training. Uh, I mean, that's that's just going to be if someone is really into that. Yeah. Hardcore okay. word training. Um, yeah. Most of it is there and, it, and it's quite intuitive. It is. What's interesting though, I do find is um, even in these core ones, you know, and let's let's use Outlook as an example. This is mm. something that people, I mean, literally live in, you know, like it's the yep. first thing opened, last thing closed. Um, yep. And you spend more time with Outlook than you do your partner. I mean, really. So uh, True. Right? Yeah, I never thought so that was true. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a whole lot of time, but I think a lot of people are really using these things at surface level. I mean, are, you know, filters and automatic responses and automatic archives for stuff. You know, I never, I, I yep. always just archive that. Well, set up a filter that automatically archives it. You know, those, I think mm. there's some extra curiosity required of people uh, to Man, really yeah. amp up their usage of these tools. And and it's hard. I mean, from from our perspective, we're we're sort of not geared to provide that level of training and stuff. So, but there are, and again, we can provide tools and stuff. But but you're right. I, I, Outlook's a great example. With most people use it for email and calendar and tasks. That's great. But if you just tweak your view a little bit, your calendar and your tasks become very very powerful. Like the way. And I've actually gone and done training for this using Outlook more effectively to manage zero inbox and stuff like that. Never got to zero inbox, but um, but some of the tools that came out would just change the view, make your calendar appear here and your tasks appear under there, yeah. and then drag your tasks to which day you need to do them. And just little things like that has improved productivity. And now when we add that with Microsoft have now integrated some additional bits from Planner, I can click a button in my Outlook and I can see all my personal tasks that I've created in Outlook. I can see all my calendar entries and I can see all my Planner tasks from all the plans that we use across the business all in one spot. Awesome. Yeah. So okay. it's just little things like that where you can start to um, play and, and you'll start to see benefits once you start using multiple tools as well. And I think the thing about automation is for people who um, don't regularly implement or do it or look for it, it sounds like building this big thing. Like automation sounds like a comp- like a robot, right? It sounds like a complex yeah. thing. Whereas some of the best automation we've ever done in the business and repeatedly do is a small thing done over and over again. And you just keep yep. on looking for that. And you'll just like I said, the you know, those the emails from a location that you just keep on archiving. Now, aside from unsubscribing, which is the other option, <laughs> if you just go, oh, I just want to save those, then yep. you're doing something repetitive. You're dragging them in. Well, just make yep. that happen. You know, just yeah, make it a rule. Right, exactly. Rules are the simplest form of automation oh, in a business. And it's perfect, um, you know. Yeah. And even forwarding. 
You know, so if yep. you look at your emails and you go, oh, that one's meant to go to that team member, that one's meant to go to that team member. Yep. If you really start looking, it may be the subject line. It may be the email it comes from. You could mm. probably, you know, use a rule to forward it automatically. Forward it on. Yeah, that's yeah, right. So- and they're, they're the most basic personal automation tasks that you can do, um, which, again, people have to be, I guess, aware and thinking about those things. Yep. Um, otherwise, you know, business, you get so busy, you just said doing, 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 doing. Um, you, you've got to take that one step back and go, why am I doing that? Do I need to be doing that? And it comes down, I mean, what's the um, the the quadrant thing, the important yep. must do, those sort of, you look at that and you go, do I actually need to be doing this? Or can I create a rule that's going to forward it to my PA or my assistant or whoever yes. needs to actually do that? Exactly. And I think, yeah. um, you know, this is something that does need to come from leadership. So we actually have in our team meetings, there is a, a one of the topics or questions we ask is, hey, is there something you're doing repetitively that you think you'd, you'd like us to look into how yeah. we could automate? Like just yeah. making everybody aware that repetition yeah. is where automation lives. You know, like this is Correct. the place to look for it yeah. is, it is repetition. So, yeah. so, yeah, and that is a mindset thing. I would encourage listeners to, you know, anytime I'm going, oh, you know, how do I do this or is there a good idea? I literally Google the entire question. How do I automate putting an email from here to here? Like, mm. <laughs> you're like, and there will be YouTube channels entirely dedicated to walking Google you through. Your it really yep. is. And yep. so, you know, people are, oh, I don't know how to do that. Ask the question in Google. And you'll mm. find there is something step by step. They're so good now too. You know, yep. there's people whose bread and butter is stepping you through so this stuff. Everyone's done. No, there's nothing that hasn't been done before. No. It's no. just how you bring it together and make it work for you Correct. in that sense. And, and that's that's the thing we, we see as well. It's not that we're recreating anything in a lot of the stuff we do. Yeah. It's just – helping people get to that point that they can use it more effectively. Nice, nice. Yep. And in terms of sort of ninja stuff, is there anything you've seen or you've even suggested for business, you know, some hacks that have just immediately delivered value? It could be within those basic um, sort of core um, apps or it could be adding on others. Is there anything that's sort of an automatic, wow, we just find people should do this? Um, I, I think using Teams effectively is probably – probably a big one. Okay. Um, so a lot of people every, a lot of people install Microsoft Teams and they're probably using it for chat. And one of the things they're probably finding is that they've got data all over the place and they can't find it. Right. Um, so it's just getting that structure right. So if I was to say anything is look at where your data is, who needs access to it, and then identify the right spot for it. That, that's, that's the key thing. So not everything should live in Teams. In fact, nothing that's corporate should live in Teams unless it's being worked on. Yeah, okay. Okay. It needs to be in SharePoint. That's okay. that's kind of it. It's not that's a home. It's a it's a channel. It's a it's a, it's tool. a channel. Yeah, it, okay. It's a it's a collaboration. Okay. It's, it, that's exactly what it's designed for. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is create those views and add the common stuff that people need to see. So use your teams to bring in your planner, so people don't have to go somewhere else. Okay. Or in fact, use your teams to create a plan so people know what they need to do. Yeah. Okay. So that's so sort that's, of that's almost key. dashboard style. Is that what you mean? Like it's yeah, like yeah, okay. you can bring it in. If, if you're familiar with Teams, you can create your team, and then you have your tabs, and it's bringing in the relevant information to that particular team. Yeah. So when they they've only got one spot to go to, I can go in here. I can chat to the team. I can um, collaborate on these documents, and I can find the tasks that I'm working on. Awesome. Okay. So little things like that. Yeah. Perfect. Now I've got. Let's talk client facing is there some things in the microsoft sort of family that can really bring the client closer that can help that level of interaction that you think people might be unaware of or should use uh bookings is one yes um so microsoft bookings gives you the ability to create whether it's a product or a service or 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 a meeting offering um where you can either have and then you can Basically, what it does is you create it. You say, I want this to be available at these times. Yep. And then I want to be able to see these people's calendars in that view. So you publish that then to a client. Client can go, I need a meeting, one-on-one intro um, kickoff meeting. Well, there might be three people in the organization who can do that meeting. Mm -hmm. We create one product up the front. We integrate these three people within the business, and this will automatically display when they're available so the client can book in straight away. Fantastic. 
creates the meeting, sends the team's invite, does however you want it set up, and it's done in the calendar and away we go. Oh, what a magic. That's awesome. I mean, we yeah. use Calendly, but if, if so Microsoft concept, have that, yeah. that's fantastic that, and, and it so makes bookings. sense. Can I ask, in, as an example of that, if you've got, say, a financial advisor always has a physical meeting with the para planner with them, you know, so it's like a twofer mm-hmm. with each client, yep. Could is is booking smart enough for the client? So the client looks and sees what's available, but bookings is considered the diary of both the advisor and the planner in that in terms of showing what's available? Is that Good something question. that um, – If it's the same para planner, you could have them side by like side. Partnered? Probably, yeah, partnered. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. I believe you could. Um, you could probably create a, a basic flow as well that would allow it to happen. Okay. Um, haven't looked into it, but, okay. yeah, it, it's, awesome. it's potential. All yeah. right. Yeah. So so it really is letting you do and, – and, you know, letting people choose the time themselves. I'm assuming it probably lets them reschedule if they need to, yep, you know, cancel. Yeah, if they cancel. need to reschedule. Ugh, like all of that. That's you know. the hardest thing. I mean, the other little tool that's built into Outlook as well is called Find Time. Right. Um, so bookings allows the the client to find a time and yep. book it in. Internally and even with clients, you've got a, an app. Have a look at it. It'll be in your Outlook called, if it's not, you can add it for free, Find Time. So you want to book a meeting with six people. Yep. How hard is it? You're sending uh. around 15 emails. <laughs> Who's available? What's going on? You can set up, you can click your Find Time button and it will allow you to then go through, okay, here are the five meeting slots that I have available. And it will send it out to everyone and go pick which ones are good for you. And it will then work out who's available when. And then it will set the meeting for everyone. <sighs> yeah. Oh, so I very love cool that stuff. Tool. Like very anything cool anything that reduces the backwards and forwards, whether it's on email or phone tag, you know, and trying yep. to coordinate, yep. that's fantastic because yep. yep. that effort to me is idiocy. Like it falls into – and we do it too – that sort of hmm. idiotic not – not revenue producing, not product. Yep. You know, it's just yep. crazy talks. Oh, find out. that's fantastic! I love that Fine tip. time. Yeah, it's a it's a little cool little tool. Awesome. Um, and then probably the other one that you could start to leverage for for client facing stuff is something like Microsoft Forms as, okay. a, as a basic yep. data capture sort of tool. Yeah, might be an onboarding form. It might be a, a data collection tool. Whatever it is. Yeah. Um. You you can create a form. You can make it public so anyone can then enter in and it will send you the details. Um. Or you can create a specific form for a specific client and okay. they have to log in and do that. So okay. Um. So that's probably yeah. something that people once again might be paying for something else. You know, they might have a yeah. I mean, there's things like. Or or others, whatever. Type form, a job form, something like that. Yeah. Um, again, it's it's basic, but it, it's it's good. I yeah. mean, you can run questions on it. You can capture data. Um, you can do surveys and stuff like that. It can okay. be a very basic survey tool. Okay. And then it captures all that data and gives you a bit of result at the back end. Um, so there's that. And then, then there's a whole lot of stuff on the other side that's um, more the advanced things where we can create full client portals and all sorts of stuff. Right. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So now you mentioned back then Flow. Are Flow and Power Automate the same thing? Are they two yeah. different things? They are. Okay. That so wasn't clear to me. Power Platform. I... Okay. Power Platform. And there's a bit of branding challenge for Microsoft, but you've got Power Apps, which is creating, essentially creating applications okay. in your business. Okay. Anything you can think of. It might be a leave request form, might be an expense form, might be a CRM. It might be... Uh, we've done accounts payable processes, all okay. these sorts of things. You create these apps um, and that's called Power Apps. And then what drives a lot of the automation is then Power Automate, no, which okay. is Flow. Which is Flow. Um, so if this happens, execute this. Okay. Triggers, so for, all that sort for, of stuff. So for those that have heard me banging on about Zapier before, I'm Zapier, betting it's yep. very similar. Okay. Similar. So, but it's within yep. Microsoft, which within is a good the Microsoft thing, stack. right? So yep. that's a, you're, you're yep. playing in the house you're already in. Yeah. Um, and it does have external connections as well. So yeah, you okay. can connect to external um, sources and stuff like that. Some yep. of it might be paid licensing additional, but um, but essentially Power App and Flow is included in your Microsoft license. Okay. So if you want to um, – access or save data within your Microsoft suite, yep. you've got access to that today. So you could, um, an example we did for an accounting firm, they they have a team of um, PAs mm-hmm. who work for the directors and they were trying to manage their tasks. So we created a central mailbox. Everyone send your request to here. The ma- then we created a flow that went, when a mail arrives, pull the mail out, work out who it came from, who it needs to get assigned to, then create a task and planner for that person. Fantastic. Just little, like, little thing and it just goes through um, and now they've got that all linked up. So they have a a PA team planner where all the PA team, they just live in that and all their tasks just come through and get allocated and and whatnot. Nice. And thinking about the way, yeah, you communicate and and via 
you know, even via a certain email address. You know, I mean, most people probably have something like an info at, but they might use yeah. that for lots of different things where you could get a bit creative about one that's specifically safe for clients so that you know when yeah. something comes in, right, yep. you know, get clever about how that's assigned. Because it is, how we do something with right, that. it's a struggle when it goes direct to an individual because if they're on leave or, they, you know, like it, it can sit in somebody's inbox, you know, and it's, it's a yeah, pet I have of, yep. of how, does, how that occurs. So that's actually a bit of a yeah. ninja tip there I love. What about things like... You know, could you do with flow? Financial advisors, we get, you know, the economist from one of the banks or one of the fund managers sends out their monthly economic report, which is an attachment to an email. Is it the sort of thing where, okay, when this type of email comes in, rip off that attachment and save it over here, maybe yep. set me a I'll task to read it in a week, you know, that sort of thing. It's like, yep. okay, yep. okay. All so, of that. All of that, uh, perfect. All the way through to what are the what are the processes in your business that you do? Are you capturing data on a manual form? Are you then scanning that or are you doing something with it? We can use Power Apps and Power Automate to create that form electronically. Um, so you can capture all that. Might be an application form, for example. Yeah. Um, so we did this for a client where they were getting clients were sending in application forms manually. Yes. Um, and they were, and the client, and then our client would have to then print that out, do something with it, scan it in, <laughs> send it to someone. It, it was yeah. a nightmare. So yeah. we basically changed it. Yeah, the the client at the moment still fills in their paper form and sends it through, but it comes into a central location. We pick up that file. We, we, we save it somewhere. We create a form around it so we can enter in the additional data we need, submit it, goes to someone for approval, they mark it as approved, and then it gets saved in their document management system. Oh, so, fabulous. Things okay. like that. So it's looking at the – you're taking it next level up. You have your personal stuff we talked about before. What personally can I automate? Mm. Take it up the next level and look at your business and where things happen. Yeah. Is there a manual form that is someone is filling out and waiting to get signed? Oh, we have a lot of those. Make it electronic. <laughs> Make it electronic. And you could then extend that over time to be a client, could log into a portal, fill in the form electronically, upload whatever they need, submit it to you guys, you go through your approval process, you haven't had to print one thing, you've captured all the data, it's all logged, it's all audited and away you go. Yeah, okay. So, but but the one thing I do say to clients is just start with understanding your own process. Yes, yes. Because most people go, this is how we do it, but we don't actually know how we do it. We don't know why we do it that way. It's just no. the way we've done it. So yep. the very first step in any of these automation discussions should be let's physically sit down and document your process. Put it on a whiteboard, do something with it. We start here, we go here, we go here, we go here. And then you can go within that process, which part would make sense to add a little bit of automation or some electronic. Don't even try to do the whole thing at once. Just go, I want to do this bit. Well, and interestingly, you've just um, given me a bit of a light bulb there. I mean, I'm just, I'm obsessed obsessed with like process diagrams and critical paths and all that sort of stuff. Mm. But separating what the process is, but ignoring who does it. Just yep. this is the process because this is the process that separates. We all, we often attach the steps to the person, and I think it can restrict the automation because we assume that person then has to do something and say hand it over or do whatever. When if you just described it without attaching the person, you're like, oh wait a minute, why are we doing that? You know, we've got three yeah. steps in there we don't need. So yeah. yeah, so the description that's separate from the human being and and advisors, I think in advice we do that a lot because the assumption is the you know the advisor's sort of central to all of that when they often don't need to be. You know, they often don't need to be the first point or or the last point. You know, it just how needs do we to... free them up to do what they do? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That's the key thing, and that's that's the key thing with automation across a business. I mean, a lot of people get defensive around automation because oh, but what are these people going to do? Yeah, I, I can tell you, they're going to do four hundred other things than that mundane task. Yes, um, and that's the thing. But people get attached to it. That's my role. If if that's being automated. What do I do? Right. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to do the. It, when we when we talk to clients about automation, it's not about how many people can we replace. It's about how can we do more with what you've got today. How can we free those people up so you, as a business, can redirect them into more valuable tasks yes. that a person should be doing. Yes, um, a human yeah, being, that sort of and stuff. and I think yeah. In advice, I think we've gone through a period. I mean, it, it, you know the heavy legislation, change, 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 mm. form this, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so I think we could mistake what we do as just lots of paper and forms. And the truth mm. is not a single member of our team should just be that. And so mm. taking on this sort of action and empowering them that if we can free you up, and and sometimes that is about the leadership pitch, if we free you up from this, 
we can get you also to do this. You've got to yes, paint that correct. picture. What would be yep. the next thing? You know, yep. what might they be designing, creating, mm. adding value to, reaching out for, you know, whatever that might be. Um, yep. And, you know, for us, any of this stuff just means we can take longer to chat to the client. We can do random check-ins. We can uh, all and that's, that and that's really free-flowing stuff that nobody gets any yeah. time to do because we're just, yeah. you know, form in, sign, hand over. Like it's just. Well, that's right. As advisors, I mean, you want to be talking to your clients to understand I mean, it's a conversation it that is. where you learn the most with them. Yeah. It's not a form that they fill out and it's not this. Right. It's that conversation about, oh, I just picked that up. Okay, well, yeah, let's talk about that next time, whatever it is, or I'll put that in the plan for you and, and things like that. Yeah. If you if, if you t- so time constrained because I've got to go fill this form out, do this, get this submitted, blah, 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 it takes away from that. And and, and we see it in our business. It's, it's one of the challenges. We want to free our team up to be talking to people from even from a support perspective, it's, right. when we talk to people about the problems they're having, it's actually not the issue they've rung up about. It's something else yes. that, that's generally causing it. So we've got to have time for those conversations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So in terms of um, you know the, the development path going forward, is there anything you're aware of that's coming or that they're enhancing or that you know a, a current sort of user, Microsoft or 365 user should be you know waiting for or keeping an eye out for? No, there's there's nothing that I would say like wait for this or thing. do that. Yeah, okay. Nothing that I've, I've seen. It's but the amount of change and development that continues to come through is immense. Yeah. It is huge. Um, I mean, there's days we can't even keep up with the new features that are being released. Okay, which is which is great. Um, it has its own set of challenges about when yeah. they change stuff and do things. But yeah. I mean, the the big areas that they're developing out really is around that power automate and power apps. Yes. Um, lots and lots of development from Microsoft in that space. Okay. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, all these sort of things out of the box. Yeah. So things like we can take a PDF file via email, we can put it through an AI tool, which within Power Apps and within the platform, which will then go, okay, that's the invoice number, that's the client number, that's the, the date, put it into this form. So it now becomes electronic. So we can then put that through a process. Wow. So things like that, wow. and they're, they're all coming. I mean, some of that's here now um, within that Power App platform. There's tools externally that have always been able to do that. You yeah. can go buy add-ons and stuff, but just within that suite, these are the things that are that are coming and that are that are here that we can start start to leverage. And what's so powerful about this stuff is, you know, if we go 15, 20 years back, then that was the stuff that only places like the big banks had access to, and they had access to it with a $20 million price tag like there were yeah. this huge right yep. development exercise and a small business well no chance you know <laughs> whereas now we're truly if if you are creative enough and you ask enough questions then you have access to top end of town effectiveness and efficiency like it's and this yeah you know and that, in fact exactly probably it. be able to implement faster and more effectively than a big business can Yep. You know, awesome. exactly, exactly. As as a small medium business, you can you can adapt very very quickly mm. um, and implement these things and change it. And and it is that it's that fail fast approach. You're yep. going to do stuff that's not going to work, but just keep doing it because yep. it will work and you will find the solution. Yeah. Um. And and things like that. But as I say, it's it's take the time. And again, it's always about finding that time. Step back and go. I can, the, the biggest thing I say to clients is what are the three things in your business that give you the shit? Yeah. Sorry for swearing, but <laughs> what are the three things in the business that, that give you that? Um, because I can guarantee if you spend even an hour looking at one of them, you will find an efficiency that you can tweak, you can change, but more so you'll go, you know what? If we actually spend a bit more time on it, we can revolutionize how we do yes. that. Yes. And that's that's not, <clears throat> not difficult. Mm. It's just, as you say, asking the right questions, talking to the right people, um, getting the right team in there, pulling the right people from your business in there and go, right, let's sit down. Um, we did it, did it last week with a client two weeks ago, 90-minute session, they're a funds manager, Yep. 90-minute session, and we pulled apart their entire lending process um, and just mapped it out and went, right, okay, we can, we can automate three quarters of that now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've still got a lot of work to develop and do that, but it, it's opened their eyes and gone, oh, that person can now be doing that over there. Yes. Oh, we can get this extra data captured here, which gives us visibility for that. So it's all that sort of stuff. And identifying those deep frustrations, I call them pirate problems because they're, right? Oh, so, there we go. I like right? that one, yeah. <laughs> um, but identifying those and resolving them, as, and you're right, it can just be two or three. 
Yep. The the weight that gets lifted off the team, I mean, they will be mm. skipping down the street. Whereas yep. the danger is, as business owners or leaders, we find something else that's a new shiny thing as a way to chase that and don't solve the immediate most painful problem, you know. And years yep. back, the one I used to see a lot, not so much anymore, but was the hideously sc- slow scanner in the office. So mm. this poor person was trying to scan every day hundreds of pages and just you know standing there like a yep. like the sloth in that movie Zootopia yep. or whatever <laughs> just like scanning <laughs> waiting and you just upgrade it spend a few hundred dollars more and things happen like this and the difference yep. in their outlook and their energy you know so so like you say find those frustrations and instead of almost yeah. avoiding them because we feel like it's hard to solve those look yep. with a bit of creativity maybe some help like somebody from yourself then you probably can really nail them and the team just yep. love it it's better than a friggin party like they just like woo <laughs> You know, and, my, and there's things that are not going to get solved overnight, and that's no. fine. But if, if if even if you're presenting a plan to the team, yeah, um, and you know, I mean, business is hard hard as it is, oh. and, and you're right. It's the we've got to get stuff done. We've got to find the new things. We've got to be constantly developing. But we do. We leave we leave these things behind because ah, oh, I think it's working. Yeah, it might be painful, but it's working. But it's not being efficient. Yes. Um, yes, and 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 there's so much, and particularly in today's climate where recruitment is really hard. Yes, we've got to retain our staff. All these sorts of things, automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning. These are all things that small businesses can start to look at today. Yes, to potentially not even need to employ that next person. Right, and because I've got someone sitting here already who you, could do it if I free them up. And you take all you're doing is taking advantage of something you're already paying for. <laughs> So yeah. it's not a new thing. It's not it a, yep. exactly. So, and I love that idea. I like. Let's use the tools you've already got. Yep. Let's really get you know lean into those and sort of own leverage them. what you're paying for. Yeah. It's it's and it's there and and it's just unlocking and and going through and yeah okay. There's going to be a cost to go and build it. Sure, but you do it right and when you structure it right, you're going to get a return. Yep. Like you and you can see that very very quickly. Yeah, well, I've just freed up. Even if it's four hours a week, six hours a week for that person, that's almost a day of extra time that person can be doing something else. Absolutely. So weigh that up. I don't know I need to go and employ another person now. I can bring on three new clients because I've got an extra day for this person yeah, to do stuff. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so true. Is there anything you feel we've sort of not covered or that we should highlight you know, in the in the world of Microsoft, I, I mean, I know I'm yeah, asking a bit of an idiotic talk about question. It all day, yeah. but. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's 427 things. So if we <laughs> if we go here, 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 no, look, I think I think they're the key things. Okay. I think one of the things people, what we've talked about really is you're you're paying for a license. Yeah. You've got a lot more there that I, that you could leverage. Yeah. Yeah, there might be some time and effort that you need to put in to turn it on and enable it and things like that, but it's there. Start to just investigate. Start to look at it. Um, Take your Microsoft, go all in, as we said. If you're going to go all in, whether it's G Suite or Microsoft whatever or whatever, it is. go all in um, in that and commit to it from a what else, what else, what else, what else can we do? Yeah, what fantastic. Else is there? Um, we look at the Microsoft thing because it extends. Yeah, we've talked a lot about business productivity today and automation, all that sort of stuff. Absolutely critical in, in business. But Microsoft allows us to extend that to security because that is just as critical, particularly in financial services and yep, those type of things. Absolutely. The data that you've got on your clients is incredibly is, We've got to treat it like gold. Yeah, absolutely. So how are you protecting that? What tools are you using? Well, we've got that in the Microsoft suite. You can we can lock all that down. We can protect it. We can we can do all those sort of things. So perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All righty. Well, you know what, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about the services that Tom and the WinTech team provides, then we're going to put the website link in the show notes. Oh, we're also yep. going to add um, Tom's LinkedIn details in there as well. So feel free to uh, stalk slash uh, reach out on LinkedIn. <laughs> but you know, thank you so much for joining. Us, Tom, I think there's just so many gems there um, that'll really that people can just start to research right now. This isn't about a new thing. This is about using the one you've got. So thank you very much for your time. No, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. 
Ooh, wow, we covered a lot there, didn't we? So apologies that we've been nattering away in your earbuds for a little longer than we really intended, but I honestly felt like there was a lot of gems there that Tom was giving us, lots of things that prompted. Um, so, you know, I hope that was really valuable. And I'm really curious, you know, if you're a current user of, you know, Microsoft, the whole gamut, you know, 365 and all the other tools that are related, you know, do you agree or disagree with our discussion uh, on Microsoft? Because please share your insights on the XY platform. You know, your fellow advisors and other people in the industry will really benefit from any of those ninja hacks you've done, any things you've discovered, any great, wonderful time savers or truly, you know, effective and efficient things you've implemented just using the Microsoft tools. So I would really encourage you to share. Now, in terms of sort of my thoughts after that, then This sort of discussion really highlighted for me that we all need to schedule an annual, at least annual, tech audit. Now, this is simply making, you know, a big old list of all of the technology we have in the practice. Every single thing we have access to and pay for and all of the core elements of it, you know, so you don't list Microsoft 365, you list all of the underlying tools that are included in that. And then working through that list, checking to see whether there's an overlap, you know, or whether we're just making things harder than we need to. This actually happened for us with G Suite. Tom mentioned a similar situation for Microsoft businesses. When we did the audit a couple of years ago, we realized that we had Google Meet as part of the G Suite. That's the video tool um, or video meetings tool. But we were also paying for Zoom for the whole team to use. So basically, we paired back our use of Zoom for just major webinars or large online events. So it was just like a one access. And then we utilized Google Meet for our team, you know, internal video meetings. So I'd really encourage you to do that tech audit. Um, you're not just going to discover overlaps. You're also going to note, you know, I'd encourage you to note down the last time anyone used each of the tools. And invariably, there's going to be some little apps or, you know, extra things that you've bought that you simply don't need anymore. Nobody's using them anymore. So you can get rid of them and save yourself those dollars. If you're not sure how to go about the tech audit or you're not sure what I'm, what I mean, please feel free to reach out on the XY community platform and we can chat about it. The other thought that stood out there um, that um, really, in fact, I'm going to go away and implement this immediately in our practice is having a client specific email address. So an email address, it could even be, you know, client docs at for your email that clients use to send things in, for example, or that they email specific questions to, or that they they interact with you so that multiple people can get access to that and it can be assigned. Um, and I love the fact that somebody could send something in and then some automation could could strip off the core content, you know, place it in another document or in the CRM or or saved somewhere and even action beyond that. So just changing the ways that, you know, maybe you've got clients that always interact with you as the advisor individually and you could change that behavior to really ramp up the effectiveness of your service. So um, that's something that I'm definitely going to look at. Um, and I'd encourage you also to, to maybe do some digging um, into that cyber element that Tom was talking about of Microsoft, because it is something we all need to be focusing on. Now, you know, it's only been a few episodes into the Advice Tech podcast for XY, but, you know, I've already had some people reaching out and asking me what I mean when I say bionic advisor and advice explorers and whether, you know, it's the same thing or are they different? So I thought I'd take a second to cover that off. A bionic advisor for me is an individual that's really heavily focused on the human part of advice and then utilizes technology to enhance that power or strength. It's the best combination of the two. Whereas an advice explorer, this isn't just advisors, right? This is anyone in advice that's avidly curious about how we can utilize technology to streamline our businesses, our workloads, and enhance the customer experience. And they're happy to sort of wander into the unknown a little, right, and see what might be possible in the future evolution of advice. You know, exploring is a mindset and it takes some practice. So to help you develop that skill each week, I'm going to be giving, you know, bringing to your attention just a little app, you know, I've come across that sort of tweaked my interest and is worth a bit of a looky-loose. So for this week's Curiosity Corner, I'd love you to check out brain.fm. 
It's, that's not only the name of the app, uh, but it's how you the, the location on the web, brain.fm. And basically, it's music made for your brain. Now, the Brain FM music is all about deep work and focus, and it's helped, It's made to sort of help you work better by blending music into the background so that you can sort of focus on what you're doing distraction-free, all while also stimulating your brain with these sort of, they call them rhythmic pulses in the music that actually support support really sustained attention on something. Um, some some people listen to music, you know, when they're working. The problem is music by other music by definition is designed to grab your attention. So it actually makes it harder to think and work, even if you don't realize that's the case. Whereas, you know, Brain FM's functional sort of music is designed from the bottom up to really affect your brain and optimize your performance. So whenever you need to really focus, get into some deep work, it might be analysis, it might be knocking off a big task you just want to focus on, I'd encourage you to use Brain FM, add in some noise cancelling headphones. And honestly, I generally get about 90 minutes of work done in just 60 minutes or less. Uh, it really, really works. And if you're a practice manager or, you know, own a practice, I'd actually encourage you to make a subscription to Brain FM as a gift to your team. Um, whether they work remotely or not, it can really change the way that they deliver and feel about their work. Ah, uh, well, Whew, that's all we've got for this week. It was a little bit of a long one, but please be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each week. And if you'd like a speaker at your next event to brief your audience on how they too can become bionic advisors, then please reach out to me on LinkedIn forward slash Peter MD. That's P-E-I-T-A-M-D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. (laughs) 